Well, I'd like to ask um, a couple of questions as we go into the future with this sort of molecular testing targeted therapy paradigm. And what I'd like each one of you to do, and we'll go around the panel, is what do you consider to be the most promising class of new drugs emerging for non-small cell lung cancer in 2013 and beyond? And I'll tell the audience that I made them write down their choice on paper before we started so that they can't pick up on what the previous person said. So Dr. Langer, your choice. The crystal ball question. Uh, actually, uh, departing from many of the molecular approaches, I really believe, or at least I hope, that immunologic therapies will make a difference. We've seen the emergence of uh, uh, ipilimumab uh, and melanoma. There's some intriguing randomized phase two data in advanced non-small cell, suggesting that a phased approach might have a benefit. Uh, that benefit may be preferential in the squamous cell population. In fact, there is an ongoing randomized prospective phase three trial that will address it in the squamous population. Uh, we've seen some very early phase one and phase two data for PD-1, uh, which frankly ostensibly looks a bit less toxic uh, than ipilimumab. Uh, response rates aren't overwhelming. It's only about 18 to 20 percent, but they're often quite durable in here too. There may be a benefit in the uh, squamous cell uh, population. The other class I'm hopeful about, although we've had recent... You only get one class, oh, Dr. Langer. Okay. <laughs> Amplify my response later. <laughs> we'll come back to you. So I yeah. actually think the second generation ALK inhibitors are terrific. I really think that they're making huge waves. You know, we all saw the ESCO presentation where the, ALK, the second generation ALK inhibitor actually crossed the blood-brain barrier and took out a brain mat in patients who already had crizotinib. So I think that that's a very exciting class of drug. So I picked that as my one. I think the problem is we didn't all see it. It was uh, buried in an experimental therapeutic session uh, during ASCO. And so even a major component of the thoracic community didn't uh, uh, really uh, see the LDK data. So it's yeah, good we're again, getting it on TV. <laughs> and again, perhaps the, uh, it emphasizes the need for rebiopsy to see if, Absolutely. if you still have ALK in the tumor and is there a secondary mutation. Well, for me, I selected uh, MEK and the MEK inhibitors. Um, we've talked already about the fact that identifying squamous cell lung, um, I'm sorry, identifying KRAS mutant lung cancer in the past was not so helpful. It might mean that you were less likely to benefit from other therapies. But the data to me with the MEK inhibitors, and again, there may be some magic to these in combination with the taxane, like docetaxel, is pretty profound, and it's just can we find a tolerable combination? The data at, at ASCO from uh, Dr. Yanni and his colleagues of docetaxel alone versus the combination with uh, AZ6244 were pretty impressive, with basically no one responding to docetaxel alone and a 37% response rate to the combination. I think some people said it's not believable that it was a zero response rate with docetaxel, but these are KRAS mutant yeah. cancers, and, the and salvage setting. They, mm -hmm. they don't do as well. So I, I went with MEK. And of course, the response rate to docetaxel is so high in the uh, non-mutant patients. So uh, I, yeah, MEK was one that I, I uh, had thought of as well. But I, I was going to go with the uh, CMET uh, inhibitors. Um, um, although there has been at least very early preliminary data that maybe the overall survival for um, the initial study with tevantinib is not positive, there's a lot of data still to be mined in terms of subsets. And can we uh, determine what, um, what group of patients may benefit best from either the, the, the small molecule tevantinib or metmab, uh, uh, the, the monoclonal antibody? So I'm, I'm still hopeful of that, uh, that group of uh, agents. So I, I would agree with all of you. I, I, I would have picked all of those, but I'm the last one here. So uh, I will pick the class of heat shock protein inhibitors. Um, these are emerging in my mind as uh, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, per, per potentially having a very broad spectrum. I think uh, there's some very interesting data in the ALK translocated population. Uh, there's some interesting data that perhaps maybe these could be combined with the inhibitors of the uh, Oncogene, we're beginning to understand that some oncogenes are much more um, dependent upon uh, heat shock proteins than others, so there may be an advantage there. 
there was some encouraging data getting back to combinations with docetaxel from the Galaxy trial, some initial observations that perhaps with taxane-based therapy, um, you know, that may be an advantage. One of the things that we've not seen in our lifetime is a two-drug strategy in the second-line setting uh, be superior to, to one drug in the second-line setting. And, and, and uh, I'm encouraged that perhaps that that, that, that uh, at least gi gi gives a glimmer of hope uh, uh, from that recent data from the, uh, uh, admittedly, a preliminary view of the Galaxy uh, trial, but, but, but I think an important observation. So that's quite remarkable <clears throat> that we have such a diversity here. But I think the good news it's is for practicing oncologists <laughs> is that there is a lot of optimism that these new drug classes are going to find a portion of the patients that respond to them. And it's probably not going to be one size fits all. We're going to have subsets that benefit from one or the other. Uh, so I'd like to go down the panel again, and we'll start with Mark on this one. And it's a yes, no. And it's, will we still be using standard cytotoxic chemotherapy five years from now for advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer? In the majority of patients, yes. Yes. I I'll, agree. Say, I'll say yes. Yes. Yes, and probably 10, Beyond. even 15 years from now. <laughs> so, you know, one thing we haven't talked about today, and we won't because of limitation of time, is chemotherapy is still targeted. So there needs to be a lot more emphasis on developing biomarkers for chemotherapy prediction. I know, for instance, with the Abraxane data, there are potential biomarkers there. 